Uh, we have Kevin McConnell from SAP, Intelligence Technologies and Solutions Strategies. Uh, Kevin is currently responsible for platform and technology solution strategy at the company. But previously, Kevin held leadership positions in uh, SAS, in HP, and other leading organizations. And from my conversation with Kevin, he is very passionate and uh, very curious about uh, all those benefits that a new technology, uh, intelligence technologies, bring to uh, FPNA. Uh, Kevin, you're welcome. Uh, and we, uh, the microphone is yours. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, perfect. So if you take a look at the machine learning marketplace, which technically is, is not new, Alan Turing published Computing Machinery and Intelligence in 1950. And for those of you who saw the imitation game, that was uh, about Alan Turing. So you, you know that his impact uh, was, you know, started many years ago. The reason it's getting uh, a lot of excitement now is because technology is catching up. And as you can see, the accuracy of machines and the software have improved tremendously. Matter of fact, I've, I had conversations years ago with um, actually some of the companies that are represented today, and they wanted to tackle some of this stuff 20 years ago, but they couldn't because they didn't have enough place to put the data. They didn't have enough place to, to store and analyze this massive amounts of data. So on the next slide, we talk about the evolution of machine learning. And the analytics is a slightly overused term, but descriptive analytics is what happened. And then advanced analytics is you're either predicting, forecasting, or optimizing something. And to give you a great example, uh, so Igor gave a great example of the forecasting, which is taking the amounts of data and then and, and saying what's what's going to be a future amount. Like if we sold, you know, the, they look at the past trends of something that's sold or transactions or revenue, et cetera. And then predicting is what's going to, it's saying what's the probability of something happening and optimization is looking at all the pieces uh, with limited resources. Now, what's happened in the, around the year 2000 is the ability to look at unstructured data. So to start looking at images, voice and video, which now can say what, what, what happened when, uh, or, excuse me, is what you can look at images and say, how could I replicate that? Now, the, what happened recently is the automation. And what most of machine learning is, is just automation of the predictive capabilities and, and advanced analytics. There's also machine learning that is using neural networks to understand is this image the same as another image and, and use some uh, predictions there. So uh, one of the biggest examples I've seen is invoice matching. So now use, look, being able to look at an image and see if that's the exact same as another image can have to take a lot of the manual work out. And on the next slide, I won't go too deep into the next slide, but the this is a breakdown of the components of each of those. The far left being the descriptive analytics, the next column being the ability to discover. So it's guided discovery of the capabilities and the data. And then the advanced analytics is what we're talking about mostly here, which if it's a data, if it's a person doing it, like Igor was explaining to people working with Python, that's predictive analytics. When you start having the machines do that for you, which I'll go through in a second, that's machine learning. And then of course there's, you know, machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence and there's some natural language processing and uh, neural networks that are taking a look and, and learning as it, as it makes mistakes and grows. So, in the next slide, I'll tell you about the machine learning automation. At the top is the process that somebody has to go through when they do this manually. This is what a data scientist does to, to build a model. This takes about two weeks at best, sometimes months. And the reason I'm not seeing this take off in finance as much is there aren't that they don't have the data science depth. Uh, sales and marketing have, have been doing this for years. But in the finance organization, they're not, they're not doing as much. So the automation does two things. It allows that to shorten that process so data scientists can get results faster, but it also allows people 
like me. I mentioned, or Larissa mentioned that I worked at SAS. I was director of industry solutions there and I built several solutions. But what that meant was I had data scientists that worked for me that built the solutions. Whereas with automated machine learning tools, I can have, it, the, the, the tools will figure out which um, variables have predictive output, which they'll build models and then they'll test the models and then they'll score the, against new data and then put it into the into the systems to be executed. So now let's see how that works in solutions. On the next slide, we'll talk about taking that automated process, which in years ago was you took all the data, did that long process we just talked about, then you scored the da data in the database, and then you took that the scored data and put it into your application. Now there's the ability to do all of that in the application. So in your financial systems, you can have it look at, you can have, it'll build a model, it'll go down and score the data, take those results and push it back up to the application. And you don't need a data scientist to do that. Uh, it's, I, that is where I see a lot of growth in this area. There's, there's people that are just taking algorithms and putting them into these processes, which is still machine learning. And that's where I, I think we're going to see a lot. Of, but I think there's also some tools that will benefit in the financial processing. So let's take the next slide. This is pretty much the steps that everyone takes. As you know, that you analyze the results, you predict what the business drivers will do, you'll forecast the expected results and plan the business. So on the first slide, on the next slide, if I this, analyzing results is something that people have been doing for years. Um, uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, there we go. It's, it's, a, it's a morphing slide, so it takes time. That, everybody needs to do that if you're, as you build your plan. What we're starting to see people do on the next slide on predicting, the next step of the process, is taking a look at capabilities that are coming from the other departments. So the departments, so some of these are more advanced or in, depending on the organization. As I mentioned, sales and marketing has been doing this for many years. HR is starting to catch on and supply chain is actually uh, starting to grow that area too. But they're using predictive capabilities to determine things that will impact the plan. Now, Historically, people use this to, to just take that information from the departments. But even if you just did some predictions to map it to the departments, you can tell when something is out of kilter. And that way it could start discussions. It's, it's a validation point, if you will. And on the next slide, we talk about the forecasting. And I, I spoke at the Financial Planning and Analysis Innovation Summit in San Diego in April. And I, I asked the audience of about two, 200 some people, how many people were doing just projections in their planning and how many people were using the time series forecasting like Igor showed. And very few hands went up about who was doing actual time series forecasting. So the, the, when you rely on projections, that could really impact your business. And if you, if you don't look at the your past trends to understand where your what your accurate results will be, and if you don't impact the business drivers, a great uh, company in point was uh, Rim, the people that made Blackberries years ago. They they followed their forecasting results and said that they're gonna their business is gonna keep going. They didn't look at the business drivers to understand that the smartphones were gonna take over the market. So it's important to take a look at this. So in the next slide, you bring together the whole process, which if, if you look at, uh, I have talked to some retailers that they conduct demographic analysis to determine the propensity of what people are gonna buy before they put in new stores or before they even plan, or even plan the stores of the ordering of the existing stores. I've talked to, tile and flooring companies 
that are integrating weather and housing start into their time series forecast so they can get more accurate about what the demand for their business would be as they build their plans. There's, uh, of course, the airlines need to factor in the future of fuel prices as they do their plans. And on the next slide, I talk, this is an example of how some companies have been embedding machine learning into the core ERP systems. So uh, one, few organizations have started leveraging the ability to smart alerts for profit and loss. And so that will show when they're going out of the guidelines. It's kind of like the new technology in cars that say, oh, you're passing over the white line. Now, you're still the driver, so you know that, well, the white line's not in the right place or I have to go around something, but it's giving you a warning that th those aren't matching the project the predictions and forecasts that, we're, that the machine is, is seeing. Same with project forecast and payment block. The, 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 embedding this intelligence right in the workflow provides you know, tremendous uh, ability to add more intelligence. And then you have the machine learning capabilities I mentioned about cash application that can take a look and do automate that manual process, and which you're going to see more of with intelligent um, robotic process or uh, uh, optimization and the uh, conversational AI. And then on the next screen, we can talk about uh, a couple benefits of, of companies I've seen. So. Velux is a company in Amsterdam where they, before they do their planning process, they predict what there is going to fail in their products. And they, they make windows uh, that actually turn into patios. They're very cool if you haven't seen them. And what, what they, they do is they say, all right, here is what we predict is going to fail. And they use that for two reasons. One, to for customer satisfaction to say, hey, expect this to wear out and B, put into their plans what it's going to cost them to repair with products or with parts and with services in, right directly in the plan so that there, there's no surprises. Uh, Northern Gas Networks does some of the same things. They not only predict what is going to fail so that they can have that into their planning process, they also talk about what is, uh, they use it for analytics to do their planning. And then, uh, Fibria is interesting in that they prioritize all of their potential. They, they predict the output and the uh, of the ROI of every project before they build out their plans to determine what has the best payback. And then Eagle Industries in uh, Japan has realized we're able to get their recon uh, invoice reconciliation up from 50% to 92% by automating that process. So. I see we're running out of time, and I hope that gave you a, a quick snapshot of the, some of the things I've seen, I'm seeing in the industry at this point. Uh, thank you so much, Kevin. Um, thank you for interesting insights. 